am tired. More specifically, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I am concerned about racism in our country. I am extremely disappointed what's going on with our community. Uh, I am elated that uh, people are getting in the streets and protesting. Um, I am nervous for the for the future of our country. Us, that we've got to face the truth. I feel disappointed that we're still dealing with the issue of racism. And Resilient. I am confident and I am hopeful for the future when it comes to any racism in America. I am fearless, especially at a time like this. I am angry. I am disgusted at the level that our country has stooped. I am strong. Thank you, Ayla, and good evening, everyone. My name is Lakara Simmons, and I work with the Georgia Campaign for Adolescent Power and Potentials Youth Advisory Council. That wonderful teaser video was shown by Ms. Ayla Burks, and you will hear from her momentarily, but tonight's webinar and discussion is our young people and how they're feeling about a nation in crisis. And so without further ado, I would love for my young people to go ahead and disable their videos, unmute their mics so that you all can learn more about them. So again, good evening to my lovelies. How are you? Doing good. Good, Great. okay. Great. I'm gonna start by introducing yourselves. And so what I would like for you all to go ahead and share with everyone on Facebook and here in the Zoom platform, your name, the county that you represent, and just like Ayla's video, I would love to hear I am. So I am followed by one word. How are you all currently feeling? So Crystal, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you. So go ahead. Hello everyone, my name is Crystal Lyons and I live in Mitchell County and I am heartbroken about the recent racial tensions that's happening in America. And I'm so excited to have this discussion with all of you. Awesome, thank you so much, Crystal. Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Alderi. Um, I live in Cobb County and I am hopeful for the future change in America. Awesome, thank you, Elizabeth. Ms. Laney. Hi everyone, my name is Lainey Broussard. I represent Cherokee County and I am conflicted on the course of action we should take as a people, but I am empowered to start charting that course for all of us. Thank you, Lainey. Marcus. Hello everyone, my name is Marcus Strickland and I represent Bibb County and I am disappointed at the state of our nation and at the state of our world. Thank you, Marcus. Ms. Tiffany. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany George and I represent Cherokee County. Um, I am overwhelmed, but I'm completely hopeful in my generation because I know we won't tolerate this for long. Thank you, Tiffany. Ayla. Hi everybody, my name is Ayla Burks and I'm a GCAP YAC member. I represent the County of Twigs. And currently I am so proud to be a part of a movement like this going on today in our nation. Thank you, Ayla. Regina, last but certainly Hi, not least. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Regina Williams. I represent Clayton County, and I am strong. With all this tension and hate, it has been traumatizing, but I remain strong during these times. Thank you so much, Regina. And to everyone on Facebook and in the chat, I want to know, and we all want to know, how are you? So if you want to go ahead and write in the chat box or comment on Facebook, I am followed by one word. How are you all feeling? Because I think this is a really great conversation for not just our young people to take control and take the lead in this discussion, but to also piggyback off on you all and how are you currently feeling in this, in this state and our nation right now? So our discussion today is going to be brought broken up into two parts. So part one is going to be a check-in, like a pulse check. So how is everybody feeling? And then the second part is going to be the now what. So now we know how we're feeling. We understand our emotions now. What, what are we going to do and how can we advocate? 
And so for part one, um, we are going to have half of our young people to dialogue and discuss part one. And then the other half of our young people are going to go ahead and take a back seat for a little bit, but they're going to be in the chat box and then you'll see them again for part two. So Ayla and Crystal, this is your show. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first part of our Zoom talk today. So today, like Ms. LaCarl said, today we're going to be doing a post check, seeing how everybody is doing. So Crystal, what should we start talking about today? Yes. So the um, as Ayla said, we're going to be kind of checking in with everybody and seeing your thoughts. So I would like for everyone to share how, what are your thoughts on the recent protests and riots all over the country? That's a good question, Crystal. Um, I would say that how I'm feeling, I'm kind of conflicted right about now. Um, I understand why people are protesting right now, but at the end of the day, I don't understand. I can, un I can understand why we're protesting, but I hate the fact that we're so angry about it, that we have to destroy businesses, that we have to destroy our cities that we built on our backs. That's the part that I really, that's the part that I really hate about that. But I'm so happy that so many people, is, these protests are uniting so many people, having so many people out there for a social aspect. I really, really appreciate it. Yes. I wanna say, I've been talking to a lot of people about all of this thing, all of these riots and looting and all this stuff going on. And people have made some really interesting points. But my favorite was someone was talking to me about um, how they thought that we shouldn't be looting all of these places or rioting or getting a little violent with all of this. And I know someone responded with saying like, it's like you're talking to someone and you're saying like, hey, stop this. And they're not listening and you keep repeating it and repeating it until it gets worse. And so now you gotta do something different or they're just never gonna listen to you. So I guess this is our step up of saying you guys gotta pay attention to us now because this is getting worse. So that's how I thought about it. And I thought that was really good. And to yeah, I, um, sorry, Crystal, for you can go ahead. For a lot of it, like at the beginning of all the protesting, I was very for it, and I'm still very for it and very pro black and pro unity in this moment. Um, but I think we have to realize that the only reason why these protests are turning violent, um, is because sometimes we have to make a message and like show the economy that we as black people like we built this and we can tear it down just as easily and if it takes us to completely destroy the economic system for everyone to feel the pain that we're feeling right now then we might have to do it we might have to go that far because we cannot tolerate racism and systemic racism any longer so i think we have to um recognize that point but then also realize that like the majority of these protests are peaceful and they're bringing people together and we're seeing change be like done we're seeing it happen so we can't let up now even though it does get overwhelming it does get tiring it does get crazy on the news but like we can't afford to let up and just return back to normal i, I agree and to piggyback off of elizabeth and tiffany at first, I was conflicted because, you know, with the riots and the protests, you don't want to destroy businesses or homes or things of that nature. But again, you have to realize that these are the actions of people who have for years who have been unheard, who have suffered discrimination, racism. And now it's to the point where they're actually killing black people, innocent black people for no reason. So and that reminded me of a quote I saw that said um, the violence or the protest is the um, result of the or the actions of those of the unheard. So I think it's important to not just look at the violence standpoint, but also to look at what are they thinking, what's their thought process. So to me, I'm I'm for peaceful protests. I, I've never stood with violence, but I do understand how people feel that violence may be the only solution to get things done. Yes, ma'am. I just love everybody's opinions. I like this conversation, but I do see in the chat box, guys, we see the chat box is blowing up. 
Um, I see where one person said my one word is heartbroken, but it's also mixed with hope. When I see so many people coming together to aim for change. And also we have a question from Tia. She asked, have you all participated in protesting? If so, what was your experience? Anybody? So I have not, but some of my really close friends have, and they've shared with me that um, everything was peaceful. And this was like two, three weeks ago at the very start of the protest, um, right after George Floyd's murder. So she was in Atlanta protesting um, before things turned violent on the first night. And she said, everything was very peaceful. Um, people were coming together, but then um, when it started getting dark, then the police came out um, and they came with a stronger force and they were spraying tear gas. And she said like, it actually really, really hurts. So she's not trying to go back. Um, but just like her bravery going out there to protest and then um, being hit with tear gas when things were like peaceful and it started just escalating from there. So that's just one experience. I haven't personally been out to protest, but I have seen on social media people I follow who have been and, you know, they just explaining how they're getting hit with tear gas, as Tiffany said, peaceful protesters. So I think it's important to um, pray for them when they're out there and just encourage them, even if you're not out there, so. Although I haven't been protesting, I've been seeing it everywhere on my social media feeds. I've been seeing my close friends. They're actually getting out there in the field. I've been promoting the, pro I've been promoting the flyers and words to my community. And in my town, it's been pretty peaceful so far in making it in tweaks it's been pretty peaceful but in atlanta i'm really really praying for everybody's safety because it's getting crazy out there guys and i mean with all the tear gas and all the violence you just have to watch your back and just watch your step and just make sure that you're surrounded by people in this protest who are out there for the cause and not out there to cause violence or to cause malice or to loot um the city's own businesses because there are people out there who are willing to help the cause and there are people who are out there that are willing to fight against the cause. So I think we have to make sure that we establish that dividing line when we're protesting with people. Yeah, I agree with all of you guys. I think that we should, we should um, be behind all of these people, but I feel like some people are just focusing on the violent part and we also have to like broaden our minds and a lot of people are doing the peaceful protesting and I think that is the way to go. I do not think that we should be violent with everything and I think that some police officers and the police are coming and acting like some people are being violent and when reality they're being very peaceful and I think that we should all follow that example. Thank you so much Elizabeth for sharing. So since we're talking about these protests and we've already talked about our feelings have you all ever had an indirect or a direct experience with violence when you're expressing your opinions or racism? I, I have not. And, um, you know, I've heard people's experiences and I've heard some people who have said they've experienced racism, but I mean, I go to a primarily white school caucasian school and i'm the only african-american person in my class but i have never personally experienced racism but to hear the accounts of other people who have experienced it it hurts me and sometimes i feel conflicted because i'm like do i know what to say to them i can't say i understand or i feel what you're feeling because i don't but i just my biggest thing is helping to stop those racist thoughts or those racist people thinking that they're right or thinking that it's right to treat people differently just because of the color of their skin. So I think that's where us as young people come in and raising awareness about that. That's, it can help people from experiencing racism altogether. Yeah, I personally have um, 
a couple of experiences. One, I was just at like Home Depot and I think I was buying some flowers or something and I got them from the outdoor section and I wanted to leave the indoor section and go check out the flowers right outside the front door. And I asked this young man, like if that was okay, I didn't want him to think I was stealing or like, you know, anything weird was going on. Um, we just wanted to check outside see what they had and then pop back inside to pay. Um, and I asked this one young guy who I think he was in training and then it was his supervisor that made this um, sly comment as like a microaggression. And he said something along the lines of, they don't um, handle people like you anymore. Kind of like alluding to like, I was stealing one and two punishing me through like, you know, he was basically saying like, they don't handle it how they used to in his day. And I was like, at first I thought he was just like a nice man. I was like, uh-huh. And I caught myself, I was like, that wasn't funny. That was a jab at me because I was asking a simple question um, and because I didn't want to appear sketchy. So um, that's just one example of a microaggression and how I kind of had to like process that. And I didn't really know what to do. I just felt so defeated in the moment. I was like, why did this happen? Like, I wasn't even talking to him. I don't know what's going on. Um, but then I've also had another experience of just like being fearful of the police, even though I was just pulled over for like, um, a simple speeding ticket or like um, my tail light was out just being so like frozen in the moment and I think the police officer was like he was aware that I was feeling scared because I personally felt like I was moving in slow motion and I was like oh my gosh what's gonna happen um so it was just that overwhelming sense of emotion um and just like living as a black woman today and I mean that was um a little over a year ago so before all this stuff happened but yeah. I personally have never, I haven't experienced any acts of racism directly or indirectly, but I think it's just crazy that someone would treat you differently based on the color of your skin. Like it just, it doesn't process, it doesn't sit right with me. It doesn't, I, my brain just can't process that idea. Like how in the world can you possibly hold that against someone and they can't even control that? So I think it's just, it's annoying. It's disgusting. I, I can't imagine feeling that way. And so, yeah. Um, I've had a number of racist experiences coming that I work at a Dairy Queen locally. So I encounter many types of people any on any given day. But aside from that fact, just it's not it doesn't even have to be as extreme as working at Dairy Queen. Believe it or not, um, I would walk into a mall. This was before the pandemic hit. I walked inside of a mall and I was in the shoe department. And I asked this lady um, if they had a shoe, a specific shoe in my size. And she literally asked me, what are you doing in this section? I don't think that you should try this shoe on. And I looked at her funny and I asked her, um, could I just try the shoe on? I didn't mean any harm. And she asked, and she just kept telling me, no, I'm sorry, you're not able to try the shoe on. And I'm, and just me as a teenager, I'm thinking I'm not able to, or is it that you don't want me to because of the color of my skin? So I walk away and I look off in the distance and I see a girl that's of lighter tone than me. She looked like as if she was mixed or something like that. And the let the cashier, that same cashier who told me that I wasn't able to try the shoe on, she let her try the shoe on. And I went back and I asked her, um, why did you not let me try the shoe on? And she was oh and she was just like, oh I'm sorry, but it was just a mistake. Um we'll have, maybe we'll, maybe next time you can try the shoe on or, and then she tried to cover it up saying, oh, it wasn't in your size. But I don't really think that was the case at that point. But just seeing that I wasn't able to do whatever I wanted to or have fun at that specific point in time, but somebody of a lighter skin tone than me could, it really made me at that point feel less of 
And like at that point, my confidence was at a low because that really happened to me. And I like, it just really just made me feel low on that day. And I talked to my mother about it. And my mother just encouraged me saying, you can't worry about those things. You have to be strong. You have to remember that you are a strong person. You have to remember who you are at the end of the day. And I really think that that talk with my mother after that incident happened, it really, really helped me. I think it's very brave of Tiffany and Ayla for you guys to share, you know, because sometimes when people have traumatic incidents such as that, it, it affects their emotional state and their mental state. And I think that also goes back to dealing with the recent racial protests and stuff of that nature. It's good to have lot discussions such as this so you can help your mental health and so you won't keep all of those emotions inside. And so I'm glad that you guys were able to share and get that off your chest. Yes, ma'am. And Crystal, I see this chat box again is blowing up with several questions, always making sure to thank us for sharing our experiences and our stories with everybody being vulnerable. And also, I see a question from Tia again that says, what are the conversations at home and about what is going on today? What are the conversations that we're having around these topics? I uh, was talking to my brother recently about the recent Wednesday looting, or uh, Wendy's, sorry, not Wednesday, uh, Wendy's looting, there was like a Wendy's that burned in downtown Atlanta because there was a man that was shot there by a police officer, and there was some protesting that turned violent, and we were talking about how this guy we don't understand how, but they were trying to take this guy down because he was asleep in the drive through and somehow he got the taser from the police officers. And there were two tasers and he got only one of them. And then the police officer got out his gun and the guy was like running away and he shot him in the back and killed him. And me and my brother were talking about it. And like, we think it's crazy that a guy like a police officer would shoot a guy who had a taser. I mean, I understand he had a taser, but you should not shoot to kill in this instance. You shoot to make sure that they stop running, maybe their leg, but to shoot to kill, that is insane and not supposed to happen at all. And we just, and then we thought maybe he had a bad shot, but I, I told my brother, police officers should be trained to shoot better than that if it's a bad shot. If you shot some, if you shot to kill, that's your, that is beyond okay. And if you didn't shoot to kill and you were shooting to only harm him a little bit to stop him, then you better check on your, sh on your aim because you should not be a police officer if you can't shoot a guy's leg, not his back. That's what I told my brother and he agreed. So that's how we're talking about it. Yeah, I've also had conversations with siblings about um, the recent news stories. And then with my parents, we spent a lot of time um, following the news stories about Ahmaud Aubrey's murder um, and just how like that could have easily been one of us on a run or just like walk in our neighborhood. Um, so definitely we have just been started by like watching the news together um, and kind of like following the story every night and seeing where that goes. Um, but we haven't had too much of like in-depth conversation about it just because um, like we see it on the news and because it's so horrifying, it's like, why continue the conversation more than we have to? Um, though it's so important to like have that conversation, especially, especially in um, non-people of color like households and just like how to handle that and how to de-escalate that. Um, but for us, it's more just like, mourning and grieving with the families and um, realizing that that could easily be one of us. Yeah, As, um, like Tiffany said, me and my family, we're um, mostly just watching the news, keeping up with updates around the case or protests and stuff. We haven't really had any in-depth conversations about, um, you know, the murder of George Floyd or precautions to take or something of that nature but I think it's important 
to have those conversations because you do need to be aware of situations that you can come in contact with and what you need to do if you do, if you are put in that situation. Just, I can chime in. Um, the conversations that my family and I, that we've been having at home, yeah, we've basically, nine out of 10, we've just been grieving every day, just being thankful that it wasn't one of my family members or one of our friends that we know, knowing that nothing that we did was so special that we could have been saved. It could have been any one of us. And we're having talks about how to remain calm and how to talk to people and making sure that you're not coming off as hostile or making sure that you're not coming off as jittery or something like that. We're having conversations that we really need to have where I'm learning more about how to control myself when I come into a racial experience, whether it be direct or indirect, how to react, how not to react. Um, my mother is mainly just telling me, don't react with anger, react with knowledge. Don't go based off of your mind or your tongue, go based off of your heart. Remember your values and remember what I raised you with. So we're just remembering that not all police are bad police, but you have to be conscious and you have to be aware of your surroundings. And she's also telling me, just make sure that you use your recording device if anything is suspicious. So also guys, I was riding home today. Funny story. I went to the wing place, got some wings. Great wings, by the way, 305 and making. Anyways, I was listening to the radio, the Michael Baston show, and an interesting question <laughs> came up. And the guy asked, well, the guy and the lady asked, do you have to be that, do you have to be a certain color to be able to sympathize with the race? And I know it's a pretty plain Jane question. I mean, I know most of the people would say yes, or they may say no pretty quickly, but I just wanna know what you guys think about that. Do you have to be a certain color to feel the agony and the pain of what a certain race is going through? Absolutely not. I think empathy right now is so important. And that's um, one of the only ways that we're gonna get past this and see real change. Um, but empathy is available to anyone. Um, you don't have to be black, you don't have to be white, you don't have to be Hispanic, like um, empathy is available to everyone and everyone should use it, especially in this time. And I think seeing like interracial friendships and relationships, that is something that's so important so that they can hear from their friends experience and learn um, and empathize with them. So. Absolutely not. I agree with Tiffany. You don't have to be a certain race or anything of that nature to um, feel sorry for someone or to help want to change what they're going through in the system that we're in. In fact, I think it's important of people that aren't of that aren't experienced, that aren't African American, to stand up and to stand with the African American community to make a change because it shows their personal values. It shows what they stand for. And to me, if you don't stand up against it, it's saying you're going with it. It's saying, it's like the saying silence is betrayal. And I think it's important to use your voice no matter what color you are, no matter what race you are, um, to make a change and against something that you know is wrong. So people if, of any color should stand up. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Any, any color, any amount of melanin in your skin you should be able to speak out. And if you're not speaking out, then that's on you. You you have to you have to speak out or you are consenting to everything going on in our everything going on right now in our country. You're just consenting to it. And there's been there has been protests all around the, the country all around the world. Places in China that are protesting George for George Floyd. And I think that's amazing that you guys are standing behind the um, the African American culture even even though you're not even in the country. I think that's amazing. 
Yes, ma'am. I love all this energy. I love everything that's going on. And also I see a question in the chat box from Miss Brittany and she would like us to answer the question. She would like us, she would like everyone to know if there's any advice that we could give to other young people who may be struggling with everything that's going on in this world, what would we say? I would say keep the faith, um, keep fighting, don't give up, stand strong in what you believe in. Um, don't let the movement die. Don't let it, you know, keep going. Just show people that you have, persevere. And as long as we keep standing together and standing as one and fighting for we, what we know is right and fighting for a change, then hopefully a change will come. Yeah, one thing I like to remind myself is to take the risk um, risk standing for be relational, be intentional, um, start at home or speak up because usually at home is where we learn a lot about how to deal with race relations. Um, and then the K stands for knowledge. So just growing in knowledge of what you don't know either through experience or what you don't know because you've never been taught about it. Um, just remembering to take the risk and like be um, comfortable with being uncomfortable because race is not something that we always talk about and we often try to shy away from it, but it's time to like get out of that uncomfort. I mean, get out, get out of our comfort zone and focus on um, making change and making progress. So. say be an advocate for what you believe in I can't remember this is gonna sound kind of weird but I watched this commercial one time and it was saying that okay is not okay and I thought that that was very very important in this time you shouldn't be okay with anything you should if you feel that you have something to change in the world change it don't be okay with just uh, living your life in the, the okay zone, make it great. Be an advocate for the change you want to see in the world. And I think that that was a very important thing to think about in this time. And as a last statement or a last remark for closing out, I would like to say a piece of advice for me would be to say, if you don't stand for something, or if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for everything. So I think that right about now is the time where us as young people, us as adults, it's our time to stand for something. We all need to stand for something. And at this point right now, I'm standing for equality. At this point right now, I'm standing for a world where we don't see color as a boundary or where we don't see the science of classifying things by color, which is racism. I'm standing for justice for everyone, for Ahmaud Aubrey, for George Floyd, for Breonna Taylor, and for everyone else who cannot breathe so that we all can breathe in the future. Absolutely. And Ayla, I think we had another question in the chat box. It said, Brittany asks, have any of you been disappointed by friends or companies' reactions of the recent racial tensions? Anybody want to take a stab at this one for the last couple of minutes? I will. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> personally, one of my um, closest friends, we were just talking about it, and I was asking her because we share positions in the club, and I was asking her about this project that our club can do to raise awareness about the recent racial tensions and to help stop it and to change the way that society is going on. And she told me that she thought it was too political of a topic and that she thought it was not that the killing of George Floyd wasn't about race and that she felt it was just murder, plain and simple. And it just went into a big discussion about it. But to me, I was kind of perplexed and confused and taken aback because I can't see what it, what else could it be about than just like race. And then I asked her, did she think it was a coincidence that all of these um, black people, black men and women are being killed by white police officers since Trayvon Martin was killed in 2012. And she, ju she just went on to say how she thinks he's about race and stuff. But even aside from the situation that happened with her, you know, some of going to a predominantly white school, charter school, most of my best friends are white. And just, 
and my classmates and just to see that they're not posting anything um, towards supporting the movement or to um, call out those officers. It hurts me because I've been going for the school. I've been going to the school for a long time. So to me, that that means that if I was in a situation where I was killed by a white police officer, you would say nothing after I died and you don't care enough to say anything. So that's my personal spiel on friends or people who I have interacted with not saying anything about the recent racial tensions. And it speaks, it speaks volumes to your character to me. And my thing is, I can forgive you, but I will never forget. And moving forward, I know how to handle these people in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing. Anybody Absolutely. else? Any last yeah. questions? I can um, relate to you, Crystal, a lot um, with just growing up in like a predominantly white area and feeling like half of your social media um, like followers aren't saying anything. And then the other half um, is totally active, especially for me. Um, a lot of my friends from high school who are white, um, they are you know, going to the beach, having a good time, um, acting like everything's totally normal. And then um, another side of my friends are like totally gun ho like activists um, online. So I have just been pleading with my friends online, like on my um, Instagram stories, especially just like pleading with people. Like if you have questions, if you wanna talk about anything, um, please reach out because I want this to be a collective effort. It needs to be a collective effort and it can't just be people of color fighting for this, but we need the majority to fight as well. So I definitely have felt disappointment but I've also seen a couple of my white friends really stand up and say hey I want to grow I know it's not your job to teach me but would you like enlighten me with like your experiences and just like um help me to be better so I've experienced both sides of it I wanted to say that I have not actually been disappointed by my friends actually I've been very proud of what my parents have or not parents of what my friends have been saying. I know I told my friend about what I was, I was gonna be talking about this today and she immediately stood up. She was like, I have to be on this with you. I have to be on this with you. And I, I told her she couldn't, but I mean, like I was just so happy and proud to know that she wanted to be there with me and she wanted to have her voice out there and say how angered she was by all of this. And that just made me really proud. Thank you so much, ladies, for sharing. Thank you guys so much for being so vulnerable. I appreciate everybody in the chat box for just helping us propel this conversation. Thank you guys for always just being transparent and always supporting GCAP. Unfortunately, this is the end of this session and I am so sad because there is so much that is unsaid that should be said, but I'm just gonna leave it at that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Lacard, but thank you guys so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Crystal. I appreciate you guys. And I love you guys so much. Thanks, Ayla. I'm gonna go ahead and actually turn it over to Marcus for part two of our discussion. And I see a lot of the comments in the chat box as well saying, what can we do as teachers? What can we do as parents? So now really understanding our, our climate because it's really important that we do a pulse check of our emotions to figure out, okay, now that we understand how we are currently feeling, now what are we gonna do about it? So Marcus, kick us off. Yes, hello again, everyone. I just wanna say I'm so excited to be here to talk to you all about this really, really pressing issue in today's society. I wanna go ahead and give a special props to Tiffany, to Ayla, to Elizabeth and Crystal for really setting the foundation for our conversation today. And now that we've set our foundation, I really wanna kind of pivot and transition and talk about okay, now what's next? How can we as young people use our voices, use our platforms and use the power that we do have to advocate for change? So to my fellow YAC members, to everyone in the chat box, I really wanna open up the second half of the conversation with the question of in your opinions, what is the change we are on today? Marcus, you might have to repeat that one more time. It cut out on my end. It cut off a lot. <laughs> in your opinions, what is the best way to promote change and stop racism in America today? Education. Like, about, mm, okay. 
I believe I it. Go ahead, Lainey. No, I definitely was going to agree with education. I think it's definitely a problem where we have been spoon fed lies about how we should act, no matter what your race is, how what our role is in this system that is so beyond us that's been built since the foundation of this country was laid. And since we have to unlearn all these things, I think it's important to learn new ways of approaching life and new ways of viewing yourself and viewing others. So education is definitely a huge part of it. I always like to say, and I got this from um, Michael Todd, a great public speaker, that it doesn't depend on just organizations and governments to um, change people. It depends on organisms. So instead of focusing on the organization, focus on the organism and start with yourself and reevaluating how do I look at other people? Because microaggressions and biases exist in all, all of us. So it's important to, one, have self-awareness tor towards those, but also have actual steps of change and action to actually change your ways and behaviors. I agree. And a lot of times when you see these white police officers or the Amy Coopers or the white people who call the police because they're afraid of a black person, you have to keep in mind, they have sons, they have daughters, they have nieces, they have nephews. So it's like, what are they teaching their children? A lot of these people are teachers. What are they teaching their students? It starts at home and pretty much just pick, um, going back, back off of what Lainey said, education. Yeah. Yes, I agree with both of you guys. I think it's important to become knowledgeable about what's the different, like what has happened, um, what's the steps they took and what was the result of those steps so you can start, not start fresh, but become more effective in promoting right. change. So education is very important. Right. And also adding on to that, once we have education, I think it's actually a great step to actually ex to start ex executing and actually yeah. implementing the execution of it. Because yeah. these past few weeks and days have been filled of people reposting stories about resources and petitions to sign. But once we actually sign those, let's execute. Let's actually start you know, voting. Let's right. start getting to the polls. Let's That's start right. you know, campaigning for things and policy change that actually can affect what's going on today. So once we start educating ourselves, it's important to actually execute and our knowledge and awareness that we've gathered throughout this time. Right. right. Definitely. And staying underneath the umbrella of education, I actually want to go to one of the questions we have in the chat box from Ms. Beverly Story. What is your advice to teachers who wish to offer discussions such as you all are having with diverse groups of students? So what advice do you have to teachers that want to have this type of conversation with their students? How should they approach it? I think um, being cautious, or it, I think it depends on the audience of their students and the diversity of their students, but they should approach it with, in my opinion, with caution. But I think it's also important to have honest conversations and to be truthful about what's going on because if you don't, you don't know how, you don't know the next step. So having an honest conversation, but also being respectful of other people's opinions and right. being um, not being biased with your own, right. because we all have biases. So you have to be able to respect, not you don't have to understand, but respect their opinion enough to listen to them and say, okay, I don't agree, but here's my opinion and here's my thought process. So respect and caution, but also being honest all at the same time. Right. I agree. And for my personal experience, I work with a lot of adults in the programs that I'm in. And I always got the question of what age should I start teaching my children or my students about the topic of race? But what you have to understand is we start picking up on that very early on, you know what I mean? So. The innocence and the you know sort of purity that whole realm that surrounds children and not wanting them to be con like um perverse in their ways of viewing the world once we teach them about race race is going to be a thing that they're going to have to encounter so it's either the yeah. question of we're going to let other people dictate how they view other people or are we going to actually teach them ourselves and how they should do that and i think that having those difficult conversations like crystal said those honest and truthful conversations about race and how we should treat other people and that our value is not based on our skin color at all. I think having that at an early age, instead of teaching kids fractions first, would actually start to promote open conversations that can lead to morals influencing our politics. Someone said that earlier, instead of politics influ influencing our morals. I feel like it's important that we teach our children early, even if it is a difficult conversation about race and race issues, because there are black children dying 
at rapid rates. That's something that a lot of people don't see, but we have black children, black girls, black boys dying. They do not care. They do not care. So it's very important, no matter how difficult the conversation may be, we need to bring that up. We need to um, let our children be aware of what's going on. We definitely do. I will say I have a very, well, what I think is a unique um, situation. Um, growing up from middle school up until I believe it was 10th or 11th grade, I went to a like predominantly black all male single gendered academy in like the west side of Atlanta. And mm -hmm. there was not um, predominantly African American teachers and principals and all that good stuff. There was not a single day that they did not instill in us where our role as a black male was in society. And it got to a point where, you know, a good bit of like my friends, we got to a point where we felt as though like, okay, we're kind of tired of hearing this. You told this to, to us about a hundred times yesterday. We get it, we get it, we get it. But it wasn't until I actually went out into the world and attended a predominantly white institution for college that I realized that, oh, they weren't just saying this just to say it. Like aggressions are a real thing. Just because I didn't really experience them in high school and all black settings doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, just because I never really experienced racism when I was a child, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, okay. I feel as though that even though when you are, as a teacher, you may feel as though certain times where you're trying to teach um, your classroom something, or you're trying to teach a lesson to some students, they don't really get it, they don't really comprehend it, they don't really want to listen to it, it's still your mm. duty to equip them with all the information. Even if they don't get it right now, it can still help them all, help them later on in life. In the chat box, a question is, how old were you all when you first had the talk about mm. race issues in America? Um, I, I hate how it's called the talk now. Like, right, I'm right. on that alone. Like, it's the talk that we are supposed to have, apparently, as Black kids in America. Um, mm -hmm. My first experience with having the talk was actually in kindergarten. It was, mm -hmm. I got off the bus and I was taking my bath. My mom came in to check on how I was doing. She always said if my day was good, great, or like excellent. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. it's just good today. And that was the first time I said that. And she was like, why was it just good? You know, being any concerned parent. And I said, um, I was on the playground and this girl said, I wouldn't play with kids like you. I don't play with kids like you. And I didn't understand what that meant. I was like, what do you mean? And then she started pointing to my skin. I was like, what? Like, do I have something, like, do I have some dirt on here? Like, I don't know. Like, I was like, what is going on? And then I told my mom about the incident. And then she gave me, with tears in her eyes, the whole lecture of realizing who, how people view me in America and how some people wouldn't accept me because of my skin color and not the content of my character. And having that, having that sort of childhood essence that whole realm that surrounded me be broken and popped by one incident it was definitely a reality check and it, it caused me to look at other people a different way which I hate to say but it did um and I think that over the past few months in the past few years of my life I've been really evaluating how that one incident is not a part of my identity you know what I mean that that one experience of hate and microaggression towards me shouldn't be the way I act towards others as well um, for me, especially my dad has always instilled in me the issues of racism in America. Um, I feel like the media only covers things like this every once in a while for their own agendas, but things like this always happen. My parents made sure that they always let me know. I had a cousin who was innocent and was locked up for years over a crime that he didn't commit and was just, I'm sorry, y'all, and was just, um, allowed out of prison. So my parents have always instilled in me that, you know, racism, that's something I'm going to experience, my siblings are going to experience. So I have to talk about it so that my children won't have to experience the things that I see. I think with, in my family, it wasn't like one talk, like the talk, it was like a series of talks. And they usually follow stuff that has happened in the world, you know, where um, somebody's get killed or certain racial things that are going on and then there comes the um, discussion about you know people won't like you because of the color of your skin but I think it really started during possibly middle school um, and not elementary but I think it's a series of talks or a series of small chats per to say that happened with me. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. I would say my first real talk actually wasn't with one of my parents at all. It was one, it was oh my eighth grade social studies teacher, Ms. Faisha Odom. She pulled me, my best friend Caleb, and my best friend Stickers um, aside and just really had like a deep in-depth conversation about how as we prepare to transition into high school, there are certain things that we as Black boys in America can't do that other people can do. There are certain settings and certain scenarios that we can't afford to put ourselves in that other people can. And just hearing that was kind of, well, kind of like I said earlier today was disappointing. It's kind of like kind of infuriating, kind of like frustrating because I don't understand why there are different rules in people like me. Um, but even though I was like frustrated and I didn't understand it, I now appreciate the lesson that she did teach me because I feel as though it prepared me for situations that I've experienced later on in life and situations that I purposely did not put myself in because of that conversation. And Marcus, with you saying that, I think that relates also back to the idea of um, white privilege and how white people are privileged and how they don't have to have the talk and they don't have to fear for their lives every time they get stopped. And I think that's a teacher moment for people who don't see it, who for white people specifically, who don't see that they are privileged. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's great. That, I, I mean, I just think that relates back to white privilege. And I agree. I was reading one of my old textbooks yesterday. I believe it's called HIV and AIDS in the African-American community. And it was talking about this one case study where there was a network in like a far off like rural county in Georgia where there was a network of about 10 to 12 sexually active um, Caucasian teenagers who were having like multiple like concurrent sexual partners. And even though they were having these like concurrent sexual partners and concurrent sexual relationships, there was no real risk of contracting STDs or SCIs because no one in that small community had any STDs or SCD, or SCDs or SCIs to, um, to pass on. Um, and the authors went on to say that if that exact same behavior were to have gone on in a county like Fulton County or like a Bibb County, the results would be completely different. And it's just sad to say because like counties like Bibb County and Fulton County are predominantly African Americans. We face different things than individuals in some of the more rural um, counties. See, let's go to the chat box to see if we have any more questions. One question is, what can parents tell your, their children to ease their minds as they grow up in this society? I think that just reflects on what we said before with our experiences. Um, I know that uh, someone said that using teachable moments to discuss uncomfortable topics is a great way to start that conversation, that dialogue. But also, I would just say, expose your children to more than just their community. I think that whether that's traveling internationally, whether that's getting involved in diverse friend groups or programs that cause you to step outside your comfort zone, like Tiffany said in the first one, uh, I think that that's really important to actually start a conversation because they're seeing and they're being immersed in an environment that's different to them and where these things actually occur. So it's one thing to talk about it, but actually seeing it, the whole different thing. I agree. And I think when you um, talk about the issue of ease in their minds, it goes back to probably smaller children who aren't able to comprehend or, or understand. They are able to comprehend, but not understand why don't they like me because of the color of their skin? Why am I treated differently? So I think just um, reminding them that they, you love them for who they are. You love them and um, that it's not okay for people to do that and to instill in them the idea of loving everybody, no matter the color of their skin, and also instilling them to remain hopeful that the world is going to change, but to also be um, confident in their own skin and to give them confidence and encouragement and inspirational words will also help. I definitely agree. And I feel as though when parents approach it that way, Crystal, it doesn't build fear necessarily, it kind of like empowers them with the knowledge. So when they do, or if they were to like 
experience it, they would know how to proceed from there. And I feel as though that's really important. So in your opinion, what ways have other people, or, or in what ways have you um, attempted to bring awareness to racism in America? I think much like the people who did the first part of this conversation, I was very conflicted with just everything. And so I was stuck in this place of stagnancy because I didn't know which direction to move in. And I needed to take a few time, like a few days to reflect and self-reflect and educate myself. Even though I am a black woman in America, I still need to take the time to educate myself and have self-awareness. And I think that from that period of just isolation and being alone and collecting my thoughts and how I could plan the and chart the course of action that I should take. I've been doing that through educating other people through what I've learned. I've been doing that through spreading awareness, whether that's, you know, posting original story feeds on my Instagram of like, how can I help you DM me? How can I have a conversation with you today in order to have for you to have a positive experience with someone who isn't like you, you know what I mean? And also that also played out through the execution. Now I educated myself. I thought it was my best to execute. And so on Juneteenth, which is Friday, I'm actually hosting a podcast in the Plug Atlanta Multimedia Studio, where we're going to be discussing um, the Liberation Day, but were we ever truly free? There's still chains on our culture every single day, so we're going to have the youth come in there and share their perspective just like this. It's going to be streamed to a wider audience so that parents can watch, kids can watch, and relate to the fact of knowing that you're not alone in the struggle and also knowing that there are possible ways to move forward from this. Whoa, I'm excited. I love that. <laughs> I agree. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I personally, I have a um, campaign going on right now. It's called Stop the Hate. And it, and it originated from um, our beta club at our school. We did, it was, it, it was a picture I saw on social media and it had like red, yellow, black, and white paint on the fingertips of your hands. And then it had in the middle, he said, um, all oppressions in his sight. And then that's where I got the idea for beta club members and faculty members to do their hands but then it went into like not just paint but inspirational quotes um in the palms of your hand about the recent racial tensions and someone would like black lives matter silence is betrayal stuff of that nature so um and then we put it i put it into a video and posted it on youtube and it's um shared it on social media platforms so now i have like extended the campaign to anybody who wants to participate and to post their picture online or send it to me i'll post it on my own page on the own separate stop the hate page on um instagram and to use the hashtag stop the hate so that's what i'm personally doing right now just trying to raise awareness and the main objective is to, is to stop the hate is and to spread more love for all no matter the race so hmm. one that. question oh did you want to say something marcus all right you're good okay you're good. One question was, as many companies are taking a stand, do you feel that companies are doing enough to take action? Mm. Um, I believe I believe some companies have and some haven't. Like I know there are many companies, they, majority of the money and the income they get is from black people. But the only thing they have is a fist up and we stand with you and that's it like that that can solve anything. Um, but there have been some companies like Ben and Jerry's I feel they've done a good job. Um, I, f I feel like it's split. I feel like it's split. That was a very good question, though. Mm -hmm. That is probably back to Blackout Tuesday, that whole right. right. That, that split and how how do I know your intentions when you're posting this black screen? Or the, Literally. yeah, the one-liner mm -hmm. of like, one. I don't understand, but I stand with you. Everyone was using that, like copy and paste. I'm like, exactly. Yeah. It takes like, five seconds to yeah. get a picture of a black screen and post a fist and a heart. Yeah. And I think that's the conundrum because people, I know that Elizabeth was talking about this earlier about people not speaking out. But the thing is people equate being silent to not stagnant and not doing anything right. and where you could be behind the scenes donating signing Working petitions on being on protests yeah. but then people equate loudness to action you know what i mean and right. being loud on social media is like i'm doing something i am i'm telling you guys i'm for this but what are you actually doing behind the scenes that i can actually change right. this 
So many companies are just jumping on the platform. I know a lot of fashion and beauty lines like makeup and all that stuff are posting the black screen and then you see the demographics automatically shift. You saw, you know, we had people who were of lighter skin all throughout your feed and the, till the black screen showed up and we were posting all people of color. You know what I mean? So I'm just like, I I get that you're trying to appeal to the times and to your audience, but I need to see policy change. I need to see donations that we've been pouring in from the black community, like you said, black community has poured money and financial assistance to your company. Where is that money going now? Like, are you helping? Are you, are you donating to different, you know, bailout systems? Like, what? Where is it going? Mm -hmm. The one word that you that I love is just the intentionality of it. One of the mm -hmm. things that's just frustrating with me is because I don't know. Okay, are you making this post because you really feel as though there there really is an issue, or are you just trying to be trendy, or are you just trying to uh, attract more attention to your company and to your brand? And that's where it's the area just kind of gets gray for me in companies. Um, but I do recognize certain companies that do go above and beyond. Like, for example, one of the co-founders of Reddit, um, he stepped down so that his seat could be filled by an African-American. Um, and one of the most recent um, things that's kind of going on in the media right now is the Aunt Jemima pan, uh, pancakes. We have um, a question so I, about that. Mm, I would love to talk about that. It says, what? how do you feel about Aunt Jemima changing the name and image? Okay, so backstory for, I know some people in the comments are like, I didn't hear about this, but um, Aunt Jemima is a syrup brand, and uh, but it's rooted in very Jim Crow, very oppress oppressing uh, foundations. So basically it was a, I think it was a play or a show where a guy did blackface, blackface. and he was the Aunt Jemima, that whole aunt mammy thing. And um, back in the day, these white people used to call black people aunt or uncle because they wanted to refer to them as Mr. and Mrs. They want to give them the respect that they deserve. So Aunt Jemima became that face that you see on the bottle of, you know, the black woman who looks like your grandma. But it's really rooted in people trying to not give us a time of day and to devalue us. And when I was growing up, I was so I was like, what? Because I honestly I didn't know about the history of it until they said we were going to change it. I was like, what is going on? I thought the woman like made the syrup brand. I'm like, you better go, Aunt Jemima. You better make that syrup. <laughs> I really didn't know. And so then I was like, it just really makes you reevaluate what other things in our culture and our society that mm -hmm. we are built are fabricated on lies. You know what I mean? Because I didn't know that that was offensive towards me. So what other things in America are offensive towards me? You know what I mean? When I found that out, it wasn't very su surprising to me because a lot of things in America have races, have a racist history. I feel like the company did that because of the controversy but they knew exactly what the history was. They, that's where they got it from. They knew what they were doing. But now because of everything going on, they want to change it now. But even like with the ice cream truck, the song for the ice cream truck, that has a racist yeah. history. So many things in our, in this nation have racist histories background that we don't know about. And people are trying to change it now because of the controversy they're getting and they're trying to keep their income, trying to keep black money, but they knew exactly, they, they knew the history. They knew what was going on. Yes, Not surprising yeah. at all. And I think when you're talking about these companies going back on what Regina said, um, you know, they post like the Blackout Tuesday, they posted that one time and you haven't heard them say anything else about the movement. Right. And you know, and it's like, is it an economic move or are you just exactly. trying to keep money or is it an empathy move? Are you, are you really feeling what we're feeling? Are you really caring about us? And I think um, looking at the thing with Aunt Jemima, you should, that goes back to being educated and being knowledgeable about the things that you're paying for, the things you're buying and where they actually started from. I agree. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's important um, where we spend our money because when you think about it, the only times that we've been able to, well, one of the only times we've been able to get respect or what we want is when we stop spending our money and businesses that do not care about us. The bus boycott lasted for almost a year um, if they did not stop spending their money on that bus, we probably still be sitting in the back of the bus, but because of their dedication and strive, um, we're able to sit wherever we want. I feel like we don't, sometimes we don't realize how important our money is and what we can do by just not supporting racist businesses, no matter how hard it is. Um, yeah, Marcus, did you want Yeah, bouncing off of the economic, like, funding, um, debate and solvency of like is that the way we actually solve this problem is not 
pouring our money into companies that don't appreciate us, like you said. I think that people had a lot of questions of like, can the black community, are we self-sustainable? Are we like ready for that kind of pressure? You know what I mean? And the truth is, I honestly do not know. But the thing is, we all know that we need people in order to make any system or any community function functional. And to say that we had to segregate ourselves and only pour into black businesses, it's great. But also people, at the end of the day, we have to live in community with people who don't look like us. You know what I mean? So I think really educating yourself on what companies are for you and what companies are against you is really powerful. And yes, where you pour your money into can actually go into actual change in our communities. Yeah. In your opinion, what things can companies do to kind of demonstrate that they are for us, they are for really moving our community forward into the future? Hiring more Black people. They'll say they're for the cause, but have a all white staff. They'll use our culture and not have anyone to properly represent that. I feel like it starts start and start employing black people. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see a blackout in a black fist. Start employing black people. That's what I want to see. Yeah, there was a crazy there was a crazy statistic about if you had a black sounding name, you were less likely to be hired for a job. You know what I mean? So I'm just Which like yeah, and so our whole, if we're talking about economics, our whole, and companies, our whole finances are based off of who is being hired in these positions, who looks like us, who can relate to the community, who actually can pour back into the community once you actually reach that financial platform where you're breaking even, who is actually going back and matriculating the dollars back into the community, like Ben and Jerry's, I know that Regina brought that up earlier, their, their prices are so high because they're actually donating it, you know, they're donating the money towards causes and for change. So I think that one dollars hiring, I think that, you know, we can tell if you have been for us before this whole thing happened. You know what I mean? Like right. it's pretty evident if you're trying to put on this front, like we've always been for you, but you've always promoted white women and white men. And I, I was in the background, you know what I mean? So I think that people's intentions really speak a lot about their identity and how they see other people's identities. Mm -hmm. Right. And I agree. Oh, I'm sorry, you can go. Oh, um, and I also would love to see what are you doing to speak out against the people, um, against those police officers, against that police force, uh, against companies who aren't standing with the black community. I would love for them to see, you know, go against your own, I won't say your own kind, but go against people that aren't speaking out. What are you saying against them? But also hiring um, black people is also, I would love for that to happen as well. Mm -hmm. I and piggybacking with the hiring point, it's not just hiring in general, but hiring at every single, uh, hiring in every single department, hiring right. individuals to fill your chief suites. A right. lot of brands like Gucci and Pepsi have had like huge controversies in the past about certain marketing campaigns that they've done that have been racially insensitive. And the reason that these things have been able to happen is because they lack top level diversity. There are not black people in the office that are making the final decisions that are saying, oh, wait, actually, you may not want to put that out. That I don't think that'll go well. Um, because they like that diversity at the very top level, it creates a lot of controversy and it allows for racially insensitive things and racially insensitive marketing to go out into the masses and create even more havoc. Someone also said take workplace discrimination more seriously and actually have consequences. And I really agree with that. So much of, you know, the black voice has been subdued because of people brushing it off to the side, whether we have black women going into hospitals and say, I'm in, I'm in pain, I need assistance and us being like sitting in the waiting room or whether that's okay, this person just made a jab at me in the workplace and the boss is going, okay, well, you know, we'll figure it out later. You know what I mean? I think it's really important to hear people and, understand where they're coming from and not just listen. Lainey, I think that is a great point that you just brought up. Black women are three to four times more likely to die in a hospital giving birth than white women. Um, I knew someone, my cousin, she begged and pleaded for someone to check her out. They told her it was a stomach virus, but her gallbladder was about to uh, rupture. So I feel like you know, it's important that we talk about police brutality, but what a lot of people fail to realize is there's racism in the hospitals too. They, um, they're telling us that we are not priorities. It was a black woman. She worked at a hospital for 21 years. She had COVID. She had the COVID-19 corona. 
and they didn't check her out and she died in the waiting room. And that happens way more often than we think. I feel like that was a great point that you brought up. Mm -hmm. Well, that stems from just a history of for years and years and years, the medical world and the public health world feeling as though that black people feel pain differently than other exactly. people. Exactly, because they experienced during slavery. Mm -hmm. And it's just, let me choose my words wisely. It's just very frustrating because when I hear that, I think that is ridiculous. Like people actually believe that, but some people actually do believe that. And it's just very frustrating to me because I just don't understand how. And another thing that I want to bring up is I know that we say that it's important for us to educate um, our children about the issues that are going on in society and in our history. I also feel as though it's important to educate our adults and a lot of the individuals that are going into certain spaces and into certain high powered offices of these companies that we've mentioned about the real issues at hand. A lot of companies feel as though, okay, if we invite certain individuals, certain African-Americans to the table that, okay, we've met our quota. But unfortunately, in certain situations, the individuals that they have invited to the table don't necessarily have the tools or resources or know what they want to get to the table. A lot of people just mm -hmm. like to invite us just so they can have a nice photo shoot or a nice photo op and say, hey, we, we have Black people here. Look, look, look we're, we're trying to be progressive. <laughs> but in reality, um, the individuals that are invited, you don't always have the knowledge of the background to really get the voices of our entire community out. So what is one way that you all feel as though that we can do that, that we can hold each other accountable for really learning about what the issues are in our community and really speaking out about it when it really matters and when it really counts? That's a complex question. I can go into so many different layers of that one. Uh, <laughs> I think that with the whole idea of coming to the table and we're here at the table, but I'm just like, how do I get fed? You know what I mean? That whole idea of not knowing what to say, not knowing how to advocate for yourself. That's a problem that I've had in the past. That's a problem that I know a lot of people have of like, okay, I got this position, I got this job, but no one's really listening to me. I don't know what to say. I don't know if my ideas are good enough. That doubt was setting in. So mismatching is a huge thing, a huge concept within, you know, minority groups where they get to this level and they don't have the, they never had the tools to actually get anything done and build up from there. You know, and I think that starts with our kids. That starts with being marginalized in communities that don't provide us with proper education, proper organizations. We can have the same opportunities, education opportunities as white children. You know what I mean? And having that disadvantage at such an early age, there has to be some sort of equity that in the workplace that can combat that. What that looks like, that that can go into so many different directions. So I'm gonna go, go ahead and like listen for this part just to see what that could look like for your opinions and all the other opinions of Crystal and Regina. But yeah, that's education is starting with the bottom. Yeah, I agree with Eleni. And just to piggyback off the idea of um, providing organizations where children can learn those different aspects at a younger age in black communities is important because it also it not only does it provide them with knowledge, it also provides them with confidence. So when they get mm -hmm. to the table, they can confidently speak their mind and speak up and stand up for what they believe in because they have been instilled that from a younger age. So I believe, um, this is a, it's a complex question, but um, I agree with Lainey, but Regina, you can add on. I completely agree with what you all mentioned. I think you brought up great <laughs> points. Everything you said, y'all took the words right out my mouth. I know that someone yeah. said um, having strong connections with smaller organizations and grassroots, and I definitely did not mention that, but I completely agree with that. Um, going back to what I said earlier about having people in positions of power that actually come from these communities and can actually have a voice and, um, and an ethos to actually pour back into those communities once it gets to that level. I think it's really important that once you climb up the ladder as a black community, we continue to reach down mm -hmm. to grab our brothers and sisters up instead right. of just staying there. You know what I mean? I think that people, when they come to solvency on these issues, they're either like, okay, let's start from the bottom up with education or let's get to the top and show people that we can do this. You know what I mean? But I think one thing that's missing in between those things is, okay, not everyone could be the top 1%. You know what I mean? And most of 
of us are at this bottom level. So once you get up here, what are you actually doing to feed others that didn't get a chance to sit at the table with you? You know what I mean? Are you making your own table? Are you, you know, reaching back and being like, here, here, girl, here's some potatoes. Like, here's like, you know, here's something that can help you out so you can reach this point. You know, what are we actually doing to help each other? Mm -hmm. I feel like that's yes. so important. Open doors for the people that are coming behind you because right. as you're opening them, you're also opening doors for your children and right. children. It all, it all comes full circle. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And if we're going to go to the chat box, I do see one comment from a Ms. Demetria Lane. Laney, you mentioned that we all have to live in this world together. How have your non Black allies showed up for you during this time? This kind of goes into the first part of the conversation with the whole reaction thing. But uh, I guess to turn that into like, what has been my action towards that reaction from my um, friends, I guess we can kind of switch it in that way. But um, yeah, it was, I definitely have to reflect the sentiments of the part one panelist of it being frustrating in a sense, where we would be, I would be posting on my Instagram, like this is happening and you need to get involved by doing this. And then in my Snapchat group chat, they're like, okay, what, what's our senior trip? Like, are we still doing that? Like, I think the beaches are open. I'm like, oh, okay. So we're just gonna completely like, I didn't get a phone call. I didn't get like, there's nothing on your story. There's nothing on your Instagram page. There's no like, hey, how are you during this time? Like, I was like, okay, well. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they're like doing the thing that I'm doing where I'm just reflecting in my place of solace and just kind of getting together my thoughts, but still weeks have passed and I've heard nothing. And so I just decided to test them, my action part. I decided to test them one day and just call them up. You know what I mean? Just like check in, like, how was your day? You know, I just missed you. By the way, I went to a protest yesterday. Like how, like, what, how, what's your thoughts on all of this? You know what I mean? And I think that um, in the black community, we always think it's like bad to reach out. Like if someone's not responsive, like that's their problem. Like, but it's right. to me that as the one black friend in the friend group, you know, whatever it is, I need you to understand that, you know, I'm more than just that friend you come from, that you come to for homework. I'm more than just that, you know, key key, like your black card, basically. I need you to understand like what's going on. I need you to make sure, I need to be sure and put my trust in you that you see more than just what I can do for you, but you actually see me. So that was my action mm -hmm. that came from the whole reaction piece. One yes, thing I my... think, oh, go ahead, Crystal. <laughs> oh, no, I was just saying, um, I can totally relate to everything you just said. Um, you know, I had mentioned in the first session how my situation with one of my closest friends and how she was talking about how um, it wasn't about race. And then my other classmates that have said nothing. And like you said, weeks and weeks have gone by. And I just think um, it goes back to um, what kind of person you are. And it shows me what kind of person you are. So I definitely there have been people, um, white people and not just white people, but black people who I know who have stood up and um personally contacted me about it and we've had discussions about it and I've also had one girl actually tell me that it's unbelievable how many followers that she has lost because she has stood with um the Black Lives Matter movement she was white and she's like people who have been her friends since she was little who have actually um unfollowed her because of all the um advocating she's been doing for the Black Lives Matter movement and I was just like wow but it, it just shows you who people really are when stuff right. like this happens. My friend Isaiah um, opened a business where he pretty much sells accessories like glasses and things of that sort. And he started posting about um, Black Lives Matter, things of that sort. He lost a good 100 followers. It was shocking. I was like, wow, like this is, this is crazy. It was just extremely shocking. But one thing that was brought up in the comment section um, is the Twitter debate about J. Cole's new song. Have y'all heard about that? No I'm name. Not. I would I go into with... that, but I love that Lacar just popped up just to remind us of the, by the time. I saw oh, the yes. time. I was like, right. new panelist here. It's Lacara. <laughs> okay, great. So <laughs> I can go into this for days, but I'm going to like flip that back over to Regina and Marcus for this one. Pretty much, I didn't get the whole picture, but pretty much, um, people were upset with J. Cole because they pretty much felt that he was trying to dismiss um, a artist named No Name. She is a rapper. They felt like she was trying, he was trying to dismiss her point and her views on what was going on with black women. Um, 
And yeah, you know, it's it's been a big debate now with black women and black men, uh, you know. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much it. People felt as if J. Cole was his response to no name was inappropriate and he wasn't really trying to understand where she was coming from or her point of view about the difficulties of being a black woman. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand not only are we divided as a nation with skin color, but we're also divided within our communities, whether that's pitting minorities against minorities or right. having people within your own black community who are, are being divisive between genders, between different color coloration, your skin. So I, that's a whole nother conversation in itself. And this is so, there's so many levels to this conversation that we could break down. But unfortunately, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I'm just going to pass it back to Marcus so we can close this out a little bit. Yes, and I like that we, even though we can't really dive deep into it, I like that we did bring up um, J. Cole because I feel as though as a musician, he has his own specific role to play in this entire issue at hand. Just like we all have our own particular roles that we have to play in this issue. That's why I wanted to go ahead and invite all of my fellow YAT members back to turn on their cameras so we can talk about like the roles that we can play to move forward. Elizabeth back. We have Tiffany back. Nice. Just waiting the on the Queen Ayla. <laughs> Marcus, as we wait on our, our lovely Ayla to come back, go ahead and, and ask that last question and then. We'll go ahead and see if there's any more questions from our, our wonderful attendees. So thank you all so much um, for participating in Zoom or participating on Facebook. This has been such a fruitful discussion. <laughs> so the final question that we want to pose to everyone is, what is our call to action as young people, parents, caregivers, and community leaders? How, what do we have to do to move forward? I'll go ahead and start and just say, start having conversations about the state of our culture today, right now, no matter the situation, no matter if you don't think it's the right time or to the right people, it's never a wrong time to want to advocate for something that can improve on human rights. I feel like that's not an extra credit or a bonus point for someone to advocate for someone else's life not being taken away. That should be expected and that should be a standard. And I think that once we realize that we're all human beings and that we all need to see each other for every demographic, every characteristic that we have and own that and find it beautiful and really just start, take the time to instill that within ourselves and that confidence and security with who we are within ourselves. I think that will make the world of a difference and will pour down into global change. Yeah, I think, uh, oh, sorry, you can go. Oh, okay. Um, I think it, um, the next step would conti be conti to continue to educate ourselves and stand up and stand out and speak up and um, use the various platforms that we already have or the connections that we already have. I know somebody mentioned that in the chat box about the connections that you have to make a change and to um, challenge, also challenge other people who may be uncomfortable with the situations to make a change as well. Yeah, we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and just remember, like, this is not just a moment. This is a movement. Mm -hmm. So you're either going to be on board now or you're going to be on board later. But either way, we need to take the risk. You have to be relational, intentional, speak up and grow in knowledge. And when we invest in those relationships and we start empathizing with others who don't look like us, then we'll begin seeing real change. Mm -hmm. I agree with Crystal. Um, education plays a big part. I feel like it's important for us to realize how important our money is and um, where we should and when we should stop supporting certain businesses. I feel like it's important, even if you're part of an organization and there's a child who, who was raised by people who have more um, racist views, talking to those children, just, it takes a, a village to raise a child. You have to realize they are the future. Um, it's very important to advocate, even though it may seem difficult at times. It can be traumatizing 
but we have to advocate because if we don't fight, then it's going to hurt our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. It's going to keep going and going and going. So I believe education is key. Mm -hmm. And to piggyback off of that, not just education, but specifically right now, education about the platforms that um, right. political candidates are trying to push forward. Now, mm -hmm. considering that we're going into the election for the you know 2020 president, and we are going into local elections, we as young people and as adults, we have to educate ourselves on the platforms of the individuals that are running for office because they, at the end of the day, are the ones who really impact our lives and impact our futures. And if we don't go out and vote, if we don't really make our voices heard, it's hard for us to help enact change. I agree. Yes, I agree. I feel like we also need to um, normalize educating ourselves on candidates. You can't just vote for someone because everybody else likes them and everyone else has something good to say. A lot of times you don't see what those people do behind closed doors because in their commercials, of course, they're going to be shaking everyone's hands being nice, but what have they really done? What have they done? You know, you just really have to pay attention to that and um, research. Be careful who you vote for. Mm -hmm. I agree. Elizabeth or Ayla, any last words that you would like to share? Uh, I think my call to action would be stand up for what you believe in. Don't let anybody tell you that you're wrong and be a part of this movement. Be, be an advocate for everyone around you because they're just embrace their culture, embrace the color of their skin. Don't try to look past it, but embrace it. And so that would be my call to action. I would say my call to action would be to be open to different opinions and be honest, not only with yourself, but be honest with everyone else around you. If you see something that seems out of the way to you, don't be afraid to speak up. Don't be afraid to give your honest opinion because at the end of the day, nobody wants to see a yes man or a no man. They want an honest man. So I would just say, let's start being honest with ourselves Let's start being honest, let's face reality, and let's take charge, and let's actually take action. Mm. Marcus, you know I'm not going to forget about you. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that one thing in particular that can be a call to action for the parents, the caregivers, the community leaders, is just to be open and honest. We as young people, we aren't oblivious to the situation. We see what's going on thanks to the beauty of social media. We understand what the issues are. And if we aren't being respected enough to be told the truth, we feel as though we aren't valued. Our voices aren't being heard. And when that happens, a lot of other bad things happen. So I feel as though if you're being open and honest about the situation and just being clear and concise and truthful, we as a whole can be able to really make change. That was beautifully said, Marcus. Thank you so much for, for those closing remarks. And thank you to our wonderful Youth Advisory Council members at GCAP, to our young people and our young adults, Lainey, Marcus, Crystal, Virginia, Elizabeth, Tiffany, and Ayla. You all are stellar. Never forget that. Continue to be the light when we think like there's no light at all. Um, thank you all for joining us. I want to say a huge thank you to Ayla, Regina, and Crystal for coming in and sliding in my email inbox talking about we want a platform to talk. So absolutely, I'm going to give you that platform. And so my last little final remarks for everyone is don't forget, join us next week. Join us next week for Webinar Wednesday on June 24th. We are going to be talking about a COVID summer. Um, school is out. So what are we doing this summer, right? Are we going to the beach? I don't know if I am, but what can we do in the midst of a of being still in a pandemic. So join us next week. Remember, go to www.gcap.org backslash virtual dash opportunities. And you can go ahead and register for all of our upcoming events. So thank you all so much to my lovely YAC members. Thank you all and everybody have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks everyone thank for joining. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye.